Good morning everyone. I'm Dr. Alaa Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura University. The topic of my lecture today is imaging during pregnancy and lactation. And really it is very important topic and the cover very important items which belong to obstetrician, radiologist, and the many specialties in medicine. So, what we wanted to discuss today? The ultrasonography, the magnetic resonance imaging, the ionizing radiation, including X-rays, the CT, computer tomography, nuclear medicine imaging, and lastly, the recommendation according to the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists 2017. So, we wanted to concentrate today about the risk of different imaging tools and how to minimize this risk and what is indicated and what is contraindicated during the pregnancy and during lactation. Let us start with the imaging studies which is important as a diagnostic tool in cases whatever acute or chronic conditions so i need this imaging tool during a pregnancy either for acute cases or for chronic cases but what about the safety of these modalities as regard during a pregnancy and during lactation because i'm afraid for a risk on the fetus if intrauterine and for the infant after delivery due to breastfeeding. Really, the ultrasonography and the MRI are not associated with risk and are the imaging technique of a choice for the pregnant patient. With the exception of, of the use of gadolinium contrast with MRI, which can be limited I can use MRI without this contrast medium because it is proved to be teratogenic in animals so it is better to avoid its use during the pregnancy so I can use MRI without this contrast medium so generally we can consider the best imaging tools during a pregnancy is ultrasonography and magnetic resonance let us start with ultrasonography, many indication of ultrasonography during pregnancy to confirm intrauterine pregnancy and the cardiac activity and the viability to estimate gestational age early in pregnancy by mean sac diameter and the ground ramp lens then later on in second and third trimester by the parietal diameter head circumference femur lens, abdominal circumference, also to evaluate vaginal bleeding, whatever early or late in pregnancy due to early due to miscarriage or molar pregnancy or ectopic pregnancy or late due to placental abruption or placenta previa or other causes. Also to evaluate cases with pelvic pain, also to diagnose multiple pregnancy and to assess the IUGR, polyhydramnus and the oligohydramnus, also to assess the fetal anomalies, especially in high-risk patients like neural tube defect as in encephaly and meningocele. Also to evaluate any pelvic or uterine mass. Also to evaluate previous uterine scar as regard its thickness any defect during the pregnancy can be detected as you see in this picture this is early pregnancy complicated by subchorionic hematoma here with bleeding in early pregnancy this is normal intrauterine pregnancy okay Ultrasound imaging should be performed efficiently and only when clinically indicated. 
to minimize the fetal exposure risk using the keeping acoustic output levels. What is this? There is something called thermal index and the mechanical index related to the machine of ultrasound. And we should follow ALARA principle. What is ALARA? As low as reasonably achievable principle. Okay? In using any imaging modality. It was found in many studies that thermal index and the mechanical index is important, especially the thermal index. And the obstetric ultrasound machine is different than ultrasound machine used for another purposes. Why? Because they measure the thermal index and they make it to the lowest that is not affecting the fetus. So there is difference between the machines used by the radiologist for different reasons and the machine used for obstetric ultrasound. Ultrasonography use sound waves and this is not a form of ionizing radiation. There is no report of documented adverse fetal effect of diagnostic ultrasonography procedures, including the Toblex Doppler imaging. The United States Food and Drug Administration limit the spatial peak temporal average intensity of ultrasound transducer to 720 megawatt per square centimeter. At this intensity, the theoretical increase in temperature elevation of for the fetus may be as high as 2 degrees centigrade. As I said before, the machine equipped in obstetric ultrasound saw that the thermal index not be harmful for the fetus because it may increase the temperature 2 degrees centigrade if reaching the intensity of the ultrasound transducer 720 megawatt per square centimeter or more. So this is the upper limit. We usually use lower than that. The spatial peak, temporal average intensity of ultrasound transducer is less than 720 in all obstetric ultrasound machines. Okay? However, it is highly unlikely that any sustained temperature elevation will occur at any single fetal anatomic site. The risk of temperature elevation is lowest with B moon imaging and is higher with color doubler and the spectral doubler applications. Ultrasound machines are configured differently for different indications. Those configured for use in obstetrics don't produce the higher temperature delivered by machines using non-obstetric transducer and settings, as I mentioned before. What about MRI? MRI is commonly used in pregnant women with acute abdominal pain and or pelvic pain or in suspected neurological disorders or, or in placental disease like placenta accreta spectrum is a very important diagnostic tool in placenta accreta spectrum also in tumors infections and or cardiovascular disease in this picture you can see the placenta previa and the placenta accreta spectrum with myometrium here cannot be seen deficient myometrium so this is a placenta creta spectrum okay this is diagnosed by MRI this is appendicitis with pregnancy as you see the appendix and the fecalis and this is a pregnancy so MRI is important tool can be used during pregnancy safely The appropriate use criteria for the American College of Radiology give a rating of 
equal to or more than seven for non-contrast MRI for the following conditions. What is these conditions? Acute non-localized pain in the right upper quadrant or right lower quadrant, in concurrent fever and leukocytosis. Also an acute pelvic pain when a non-gynecological cause is suspected. Also in suspected biliary disease such as jaundice or suspected pancreatic disease or new onset severe headache or newly diagnosed cancer. So this is many indications for MRI which can be done during pregnancy. The principal advantage of MRI over ultrasonography and CT is the ability to image deep soft tissue structures in a manner that is not operator dependent and doesn't use ionizing radiation and this is very important. There are no precautions or contraindications specific to pregnant women. MRI is similar to ultrasonography in the diagnosis of amnesitis, but when MRI is readily available, it is preferred because of its lower rate of non-visualization. As in this picture, this is appendicitis with pregnancy diagnosed by MRI. Unlike CT, MRI adequately image most soft tissue structure without use of contrast. And this is very important. However, there are diagnostic situations in which contrast enhancement is of benefit. We have really two types of contrast in MRI gadolinium based agents and super paramagnetic iron oxide particles. Super, super paramagnetic iron oxide particles, no studies about it in human, so we don't know about its trastogenicity, so never to be used during pregnancy. What about gadolinium? Gadolinium studies have been done an animal proved to be teratogenic. So, but not yet in human. So, it is better to avoid the use of contrast during pregnancy. So, use MRI can give you the diagnosis without contrast. Only in certain situation where the contrast is very important, in such a condition you will measure the benefit risk ratio okay so you can use it only for very limited cases look to this picture please it's a very interesting pictures with mri this is bilateral interstitial tubal ectopic pregnancy diagnosed by ultrasound here and the the same by MRI here, as you see by MRI, it is clear, bilateral ectopic pregnancy, interstitial. This one is appendicitis pregnancy diagnosed by MRI. This one is placenta previa and accreta spectrum diagnosed by MRI in this picture, as you see here. No mimetrium can be seen in this area. Gadolinium is water soluble and it can cross the placenta into the fetal circulation and the amniotic fluid. And as I said, it is teratogenic in animal studies, so we should limit its use during pregnancy as much as we can. The water solubility of gadolinium agents limit their excretion into pressed milk less than 0.04 percent of an intravascular dose of gadolinium contrast is excreted into the pressed milk within the first 24 hour so this is a very negligible negligible amount excreted in bed and you sh should notice also that less than one percent of this minimal dose absorbed through the GIT of the, of the fetus. That's why 
there is no report about harm from the breastfeeding because it is very very minimal amount reach the fetus the baby sorry so in breastfeeding you shouldn't stop breastfeeding even if you used MRI with gadolinium contrast medium what about ionizing radiation including x-ray this is commonly used for evaluation of significant medical problem trauma x-ray procedures are indicated during a pregnancy or may occur inadvertently before the diagnosis of pregnancy sometimes the woman do x-ray while she don't know that she is pregnant or the pregnancy is not yet diagnosed in addition it is estimated that the fetus will be exposed to one milligray of background radiation during pregnancy from the environment. The risk to a fetus from ionizing radiation is dependent on the gestational age at the time of exposure and the dose of radiation. This is the most important to fact. The gestational age early in pregnancy or mid pregnancy or late pregnancy and the dose of radiation please log to this table you can see the dose and relative effective dose how can be measured and the legacy unit used in case of dose and radiation we use red red and one gray equal to 100 red okay so one gray equal to 100 red what about relative effective dues the legacy unit is run run equivalent man in abbreviation rem r e m One severed, one severed equal to 100 rem. Okay, so when you use these expressions, you understand them very well. So, what about the dues of radiation and the gestational age? We said this is the most important factors affecting the result of exposure to radiation and which gestational age the pregnant lady in. Let us start before implantation from zero to two weeks. If the lady exposed to radiation 50 to 100 milligray or more, death of embryo or no consequence. So the rule is all or none. Death or no consequence the most dangerous period from two to eight weeks pregnancy from two to eight week eight weeks this is the period of organogenesis the threshold dose 200 milligray or more the effect is congenital anomalies like eyes skeleton genital if 200 to 250 gross restriction also gestational age from 8 to 15 weeks severe intellectual disability and intellectual deficit with the doses 60 to 310 milligray and 25 per 10 point loss per 1000 milligray This is the intellectual deficit. At gestational age, 16 to 25 weeks, severe intellectual disability at a dose of 250 to 280 milligray. This table should be well known for all obstetrician and of course radiologists.
This table show you common radiologic examination and the fetal radiologic dose. This is the amount of dose expected with these imaging modalities. We divide them into very low dose examination, which is below 0.1 milligray, low to moderate dose examination from 0.1 up to 10 milligray, higher dose examination from 10 to 50 milligray. Of course, the higher dose with abdominal CT, pelvic CT, positron emission tomography, which is the highest, really highest dose, reaching up to 50 milligray. The critical amount is 50 milligray, at which and above affect the fetus seriously, especially in early pregnancy. You can read different imaging modalities here with each dose. If extremely high dose exposure in excess of one gray occurs during early embryogenesis, most likely to be lethal to the embryo. However, these dose levels are not used in diagnostic imaging, never to reach this one gray in diagnostic imaging. The risk of carcinogenesis as a result of a neutral exposure of ionizing radiation is unclear, but probably it is very small. A 10 to 20 milligray fetal exposure may increase the risk of leukemia by a factor of 1.5 to 2 over a background rate of approximately 1 in 3,000. What about if we have a case with pregnant lady and did a single plane radiograph? This doesn't contribute to a significant radiation dose to the fetus. You should counsel your patient about that The estimated radiation dose to the fetus varies and ranges from 0.001 milligray to 10 milligray. The highest radiation dose with the lumbar spine plane X-ray, which has a maximum fetal radiation dose of 10 milligray, which is significantly lower than the threshold limit of the safe radiation exposure dose of 50 milligray as we mentioned before. X-ray beams that project in the posterior to anterior direction contribute to less radiation than the beam projected in anterior to posterior direction. Why? Because in posterior anterior projection the X-ray gets attenuated before reaching anterior located uterus. All of us know that the pregnant uterus becomes superior and anterior to the pelvis. Okay? Okay. When you ask me which is better to do posterior anterior plane x ray or anteroposterior x ray, I'll say posterior anterior is better. Why? Because in posterior anterior there is attenuation of the beam before reaching the uterus which is located anterior but if you did it anteroposterior you expose the pregnancy to more radiation so just changing the direction from anteroposterior to be posterior anterior is beneficial to the pregnant lady and the less the exposure to radiation okay so anybody ask you which is better to do anteroposterior, posterior, anterior? If not affecting the, the the diagnosis or the aim from the imaging tool, so we should choose the posterior, anterior. And now you understand why.
pregnancy termination shouldn't be recommended solely on the basis of exposure to diagnostic radiation because this is a mistake with many obstetricians. They decide to do termination because the lady exposed to plain X-ray film, for example. This is not right. You shouldn't recommend termination of pregnancy for just a plain X-ray or something like that. Okay? As I said before, the dose is not dangerous and not reaching the threshold that harm the fetus. Should a pregnant woman undergo multiple imaging studies using ionizing radiation, it is prudent to consult with a radiation physician to calculate the total dose received by the fetus. So, for any imaging modalities with ionizing radiation, I should calculate the total dose reaching the fetus if I did this investigation, okay? And then see from the table, is it dangerous? Is it reaching the threshold to be harmful to the fetus or not? Then measure the risk benefit ratio. There is no risk to lactation from external sources of ionizing radiation like diagnostic X-rays. So you can tell the, the lactating woman to continue breastfeeding. What about CT, computerized tomography? Is a specific use of ionizing radiation that plays an important diagnostic role in pregnancy and its use increased by 25% per year from 1997 to 20, 2006. Okay, so market increase in its use by 25% from 1997 till 2006. Use of CT and associated contrast material shouldn't be withheld if clinically indicated. But a thorough discussion of risks and the benefits should take place. You should counsel the patient and tell her about the risk because, yes, CT is not safe like MRI. MRI is safe, ultrasound is safe, but CT expose the fetus to radiation with high dose, maybe reaching the threshold, maybe, okay? Of course, there are many techniques to reduce the amount of radiation reaching the baby, and you should use it, and to make the radiation below the threshold of harm. In the evaluation for acute processes such as appendicitis or a small bowel obstruction, the maternal benefit from early and accurate diagnosis may outweigh the theoretical fetal risks. If, access, if accessible in a timely manner, MRI should be considered as a safer alternative to CT imaging during a pregnancy in, ca in cases which they are equivalent for diagnosis. So, if both imaging tool equivalent in diagnosis, MRI and CT, of course I'll choose MRI because it is safe. Radiation exposure from CT procedures varies depending on the number and the spacing of adjacent image sections. Let us see the again the table again. This is the CT considered in the low to moderate dose examination. As you see here, you can calculate the dose per milligray and see if these sections calculate the total amount of radiation, how many sections you taken, and the total amount reaching the threshold of 50 milligray or not. This is the idea. Of course, also CT considered also on high dose examination in abdominal one and the pelvic one and in positron emission tomography with T. Okay? For example, CT pelvimetry exposure can be as high as 50 milligray, but can be reduced to approximately 2.5 milligray. 
including fetal gonad exposure by using what by using low exposure technique that is adequate for diagnosis so i can the radiologist can change the technique to use the low exposure technique so i decrease from 50 milligray till reaching 2.5 milligray you notice the difference how much so 2.5 milligray is not harmful to the baby okay by using the low exposure technique in the case of suspected pulmonary embolism ct evaluation of the chest result in a lower dose of fetal exposure to radiation compared with ventilation perfusion scanning so if i use ct chest it will be less hazardous than ventilation perfusion scan because less exposure to radiation with typical use the radiation exposure to the fetus from spiral ct is comparable with conventional ct oral contrast what about it in ct are not absorbed by the patient and the don't cause a real or theoretical harm. The use of intravenous contract, contrast media aids in CT diagnosis by providing core enhancement of soft tissue and vascular structure. The contrast most commonly used for CT is iodinated media, which carry a low risk of adverse effect, like nausea, vomiting, flushing, pain at the injection site, and also can cause anaphylactoid reactions, which is risky. Although iodinated contrast media can cross the placenta and either enter the fetal circulation or pass directly into the amniotic fluid, animal studies have reported no teratogenic or mutagenic effect from its use. Okay. Theoretical concerns about the potential adverse effect of free iodide on the fetal thyroid gland have not been borne out in human studies, not proved. The effect of iodide on the fetal thyroid of the contrast media. Despite this lack of known harm, it generally is recommended that contrast only be used if absolutely required to obtain additional diagnostic information that will affect the care of the fetus or woman during the pregnancy. So try to use CT if needed, highly indicated, but without using contrast for also risk of iodide. Although the animal studies prove the no risk, but we are afraid from the iodide to be absorbed and affecting the thyroid gland of the fetus. Okay. So try to use CT scan without the contrast media. If not affecting the diagnosis. What about lactation with using CT? Traditionally lactating women who receive intravascular adenated contrast have been advised to discontinue breastfeeding for 24 hours this is used for many years the advice for for lactating woman to stop lactation for 24 hours after she did ct scan with contrast media because it is iodinated because they are afraid from its uh, secretion and breast milk but really this is not right and the lady should continue breastfeeding, not stop for 24 hours. Why? This iodinated contrast is water soluble, and less than 1% of this iodinated contrast is secreted into breast milk. So it is very minimal now. And also, less than 1% absorbed in the gastrointestinal of the baby therefore breastfeeding should be continued without interruption after using this contrast meeting let us go to another 
imaging modalities which is nuclear medicine imaging nuclear studies as pulmonary ventilation perfusion thyroid bone and renal scans are performed by tagging a chemical agent with radioisotope as you see in this picture this is pulmonary ventilation perfusion and you can notice the difference between the normal and the mild the moderate the severe effect of pulmonary ventilation perfusion as in pulmonary embolism and the pneumonia okay you can see the difference you can see here is the ventilation and here is the perfusion this is the normal and this is the mild affection this is moderate affection and this is severe affection of ventilation and perfusion on the right side this is for thyroid scan as you see here with technician 99 this type of imaging nuclear medicine is used to determine the physiologic organ function or dysfunction rather than delineate anatomy but if I wanna to test the function and to delineate anatomy I can use hybrid system which combine the function of nuclear imaging devices with computed tomography as in positron emission tomography for example okay to improve quality of information required in pregnancy fetal exposure during nuclear medicine studies depend on physical and the biochemical properties of radioisotope so not all radioisotopes the same for example i have technician 99 and i have iodide 131 which is more dangerous the iodide 131 so if i i need to do nuclear medicine imaging i'll use technician 99 which is much much more better than iodide 131 okay so technician 99 is one of the most commonly used isotopes and is used for brain bone renal and the cardiovascular scans and it also it is most common use in pregnancy in ventilation perfusion lung scanning for detection of pulmonary embolism in general, this procedure results in an embryonic or fetal exposure of less than 5 mg, which is considered safe dose in pregnancy. The half-life of this radioisotope is 6 hours. And this is another advantage over the other isotope, which is iodide-131, because the half-life in iodide is days, while in technetium it is 6 hours. And it is a pure gamma ray emitter, which minimizes the dose of radiation without compromising the image. All these facts support the safety of technician 99 at 5 milligray when indicated during pregnancy. This is thyroid scan with technician 99 in this picture. Radioactive iodine, iodine 131, readily across the placenta has a half-life eight days and can adversely affect the fetal thyroid whether for diagnostic or therapeutic treatment purposes iodine 131 shouldn't be used shouldn't be used during the pregnancy if diagnostic scan of thyroid is essential i can use technician 99 which is much better radionuclide the radionuclide compounds are excreted into breast milk in a varying concentration and for varying periods of time in addition rate of excretion of the same compound can vary between patients so if she asked you the lactating woman and she did nuclear medicine imaging can she continue breastfeeding or not you should stop breastfeeding you should ask her to stop breastfeeding if she has a nuclear medicine imaging why because this nuclear material is secreted into breast milk and they can have deleterious effect 
So consultation with experts on breastfeeding and the nuclear medicine are recommended when these compounds are used in lactating women. And I advise to stop breastfeeding if she exposed to this nuclear medicine image. What about angiography? Fetal radiation exposure from angiography, as in this picture, this is cranial angiography for aneurysm, intracranial artery aneurysm. Fetal radiation exposure from angiography and the fluoroscopy should only be for emergent clinical setting. A physician performing fluoroscopy should utilize essential dose reducing technique, including pulse fluoroscopy instead of continuous. Of course, pulse fluoroscopy less exposure to radiation than continuous fluoroscopy. Last image hold rather than full exposure. This is very important also to minimize radiation. And cool limitation to appropriate field of view. Magnification increases the radiation dose and shouldn't be used. What about positioning? Appropriate positioning is important. Yes, it is important. Why? Because if technologists optimally position patient before imaging, they will obtain appropriate view for exam. And obtaining obtaining diagnostic imaging at first attempt eliminate the need for repeat examination and significantly reduce unnecessary radiation exposure to the fetus. So I want to finish the target at a first attempt. Okay, I won't. I will not be happy to repeat the exposure because the first film or first examination wasn't enough so proper position of the patient by a technologist is very important in pregnant lady so i i wanna to be one shot not repeated for no more exposure to radiation what about shielding fetal and gonadal shielding is it important really there is belief for many doctors, obstetrician, radiologists, that we should use shield for many years. But recently, we found that in many studies that shielding is not important and is no longer necessary. You will be surprised from this, but not to be surprised because we, all the studies recently done found that Use of shield may be more risky. Why? Because there is certain side of the body not exposed to the examiner during radiation. So you want to repeat again. With repeating the exam to the again, exposing the patient to more radiation. So the total amount of radiation exposure is larger. It was found that patient, pregnant patient, without shielding, the radiation, the amount of total radiation exposure is less than that who are using shielding because many women are not in optimal position or the area to be examined not fully covered in one set exam. So we repeat the examination with more exposure to radiation. So Generally, nowadays, and the guideline advise not to use shield and use only Alara principle. What is Alara principle? Alara as low as reasonably achievable. This means doctor use the lowest amount of radiation necessary to make quality image. And the patient should be confident that hospital and the imaging center use this Alara principle, okay? This is my target, to expose the patient to the minimal amount of radiation. This is my target. And you should know that with recent modalities of imaging machines, 
there is less exposure than the past 70 years. You can imagine the decrease in radiation exposure reaching up to 96% with the recent machines used for imaging. Imagine that. So this less harmful to the pregnant lady and her baby. What about people who are working in an area exposed to radiation and they carry occupational risk? Occupational radiation exposure should be monitored to make sure that total amount of radiation exposure is under the regulatory limit. According to the National Council of Radiation Protection and the Measurement, the total dose equivalent to the embryo of fetus shouldn't exceed 500 millirem during the length of the pregnancy. Also, it shouldn't exceed 50 millirem in any mouse in any month, sorry, during the pregnancy. So, I measure the amount of radiation exposure total dose equivalent, which is measured by REM, as we, we said before, Rantgen, equivalent man, Rantgen, equivalent man. This is the abbreviation for that, REM. So, during the whole pregnancy, the total amount shouldn't exceed 500 millirem. And during only one month, shouldn't exceed 50 millirem. Okay, clear enough during the pregnancy. Let us go to the recommendation by the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologist, 2017. Ultrasonography and the MRI are not associated with risk and are the imaging technique of choice for the pregnant patient, but they should be used prudently and only when use is expected to answer a relevant clinical question or otherwise provide medical benefit to the patient. True. With few exceptions, radiation exposure through radiography, CT scan, or nuclear medicine imaging technique is at a dose much lower than, expo than the exposure associated with fetal heart. If these techniques are necessary in addition to ultrasonography or MRI, or are more readily available for the diagnosis in a question, they shouldn't be withheld from pregnant patients. The use of gadolinium contrast with MRI should be limited. As I mentioned before, it may be used as a contrast agent in a pregnant woman only if it significantly improves diagnostic performance and is expected to improve fetal or maternal outcome. Breastfeeding shouldn't be interrupted after gadolinium administration and this is the last slide. Thank you. I'm Dr. Alam Musbah, Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, Mansoura,